Well, the COVID-19 pandemic is turning out to be a blessing for the church. Did I just say that? Yes, I said it is turning out to be a blessing for the church. How can that be? Well, it is helping believers everywhere to see the true condition of their faith. It is helping believers everywhere to see whether they are in the faith or out of the faith. It is helping believers to examine their walk with the Lord. So some people who thought that a Christian is someone who wanders into a church building and sits down there for about an hour a week, and that's all that defines a Christian, well, that external activity has now been taken away. It has been taken away for a season. And as that activity has been removed, it has forced that person to ask the question, what really makes me a Christian? Am I a Christian? If the only Christian thing I do is now taken away from me. And what does it really mean to be a Christian anyways? And that's a great question. That is a, an important question. Because at this point in history, you can't just easily say, well, a Christian is someone who sits in church on a Sunday. You can't say, well, a Christian is someone who attends Bible study every week. Well, a Christian is someone who enjoys a cup of tea and coffee after the church service on a Sunday. Well, a Christian is someone who visits their friends from church all the time. Well, a Christian is someone who shakes my hand or even gives me a hug or, or, or really gives me a high five, a welcoming high five on a Sunday. All those things have been taken away. They've been taken away for a season, for a while. And so now, we all have to look a bit deeper. We have to ask, what makes a Christian different from an unbeliever? What makes a Christian different from an unbeliever on the inside? Because some of the outside things have been taken away. And now we need to ask, what really is the inner difference? And this is really the only true way to consider what a Christian is. Because, you see, the Bible teaches that a Christian is someone who has been born again or born from above. And this has been a miraculous transformation that God has worked in the heart of the believer. You see, the Christian was once just like everyone else in the world, loving the world, loving the things of the world, loving themselves, and loving sin. But at a moment in time, the Holy Spirit reveals to the Christian that they are a sinner and they will stand guilty before a holy God one day. And this realization causes the Christian then to, to flee from sin and turn to Christ. And when that happens, that person has been converted. They have come to Christ. And from that moment on, that person now is a new creation. Their desires are now different. They now desire God. They love what God loves. They want to know what pleases God, and they want to do it. And that is their heart's disposition. That's the inner reality that then shapes the outward behavior. And so, for this true Christian then, when some form of obeying God is taken away, then th these people, they, they don't just go into hiding and disappear. They don't just meld into the background and no one really knows who a Christian is anymore. That doesn't happen. When some external activity is taken away from this person, they don't suddenly stop loving the things of God. When when they are not faced with that accountability of weekly gathering and weekly study of God's Word, they suddenly don't, stop neglect, they don't just start neglecting the Word of God and, and tossing it aside and not reading it at all. When this person faces difficulties during this time, they don't suddenly change from being committed to now being unhappy. That's because... God has replaced their heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And this morning, we're going to hear Jesus speak about the heart of true religion or the heart of true faith. 
And so we need to hear what Jesus says so we don't restrict Christianity to some ceremonial laws, some outward form of obedience. But instead, we see Christianity as it truly is, as a matter of the heart. So turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we'll be reading from verse 1 all the way through to verse 23, so we get the context. But we'll be looking in detail at verses 14 through to 23. So let's read this passage together. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him. They observed that some of his disciples were eating their bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, in fact all the Jews, will not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they, came from the, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed. And there are many other customs they have received and keep, like the washing of cups, jugs, copy utensils, and dining couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating bread with richly unclean hands? He answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Disregarding the command of God, you keep the tradition of men. He also said to them, You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, Whatever benefit you might have received from me is korban, that is, a gift committed to the temple, you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many other similar things. Summoning the crowd again, he told them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Sorry, nothing, verse 15. Nothing that goes into a person from the outside can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. If anyone has ears to hear, he should listen. When he went into the house away from the crowd, the disciples asked him about the parable. Verse 18, and he said to them, Are you also as lacking in understanding? Don't you realize that nothing going into a man from the outside can defile him? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into the stomach, and is eliminated. And as a result, he made all food clean. Then he said, What comes out of a person, that defiles him. For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. And so reads the words of the living God. In this passage, we see three principles of true religion. Three principles of true religion. We see first that the heart originates, verses 14 to 16, the heart originates. And then we see the second point is that the second principle is that the stomach eliminates. The stomach eliminates in verses 17 to 19. And then we see finally the third principle, the life reverberates. The life reverberates, and that's in verses 20 to 23. So those are the three principles of true religion we see unfolded in this passage. Well, last week... As we looked at verses 1 to 13, we, we saw what dead religion looked like. And the Pharisees and scribes who came to inspect Jesus' ministry, they were the poster boys for dead religion. They were so serious about the things of God that they invented their own outward ways of trying to please God. These were ceremonies and washings that could in no way change the inner condition of anyone's heart, but they could make someone look more holy in front of other people. 
And when they, when they adopted these traditions and when they made it part and parcel of what it meant to be a, a person of God, a, a man or woman of God, when they did this, they squeezed the lifeblood out of true religion and they were left with a lifeless thing that had no power to change them or anyone else. How did they do this? Well, they did this by first making up their own rules, which are not clear from the Scripture. And then they strictly enforced their own rules while ignoring the more challenging demands of Scripture. And when their rules started eventually, as all man-made rules do, they started eventually contradicting the truths of Scripture. Well, then they held fast to their rules and jettisoned Scripture. And when they did that, they ended up with hypocrisy parading itself as true religion. And the only option they had left then was to praise other people who adopted their hypocrisy and then to find fault with people who taught truly religion, people like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so Jesus rebuked the Pharisees sharply for this dead religion they were living and promoting to other people. He called them hypocrites. He called out their hypocrisy. And he gave them an example of their hypocrisy. But as we enter the second part of our narrative, which we'll be looking at this morning, he turns away from this important delegation that has come down, and he addresses the crowd again, and then his disciples. He was, he was not going to waste more time with the Pharisees and scribes at this point. He turns to those who at least recognize they have some need of him, the crowd and his disciples, and he, he lays down a fundamental principle of true religion. And the first principle he lays down is the heart originates. The heart originates. And that's in verses 14 to 16. So as we get down to verse 14 there, uh, I want to just explain what's happening here. The crowd, when, Jesus, when the Pharisees came to Jesus, the crowd has respectfully moved back so that this, this important delegation from Jerusalem could come and speak to Jesus directly. But now Jesus has completed his conversation, his rebuke of these Pharisees and scribes, and now he turns away from them and invites the crowd who has gone back to come back closer to him so that he can address them about this issue he has just discussed with the Pharisees. And so it says in verse 14, summoning the crowd again, drawing them closer to him again, he told them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. This is a sober and serious call to the crowd to, to try and understand what Jesus is saying. It means that what Jesus is about to say is weighty. It is important. It is of great consequence. And it, he says this in verse 15, this is the principle here. Nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. This is the most basic principle that this discussion with the Pharisees raised. And the basic principle is this. No kind of food can make you sinful or morally impure or unclean. But the things that come from your heart or moral nature can make you sinful, unclean, morally impure. The things that make us morally impure don't come from the outside, they come from the inside. To put it simply, sin is not an import, it's an export. Sin is not imported into your heart by what you eat. Sin is exported from your heart by your thoughts, words, and actions. This is a mind-blowing statement for a Jew to hear, even for many people to hear today. And in Matthew 15 verse 12, the parallel account, we see that the Pharisees are deeply offended by the statement. Why? Because they were so serious about these external things. They committed their lives to external purity, to observing external purity. They lived for the ceremonial law. And they thought that doing these washings, not eating certain foods, 
could really make them more holy and more pure and more acceptable in God's sight. And Jesus is here telling them that they've got it all wrong. Jesus is telling them that the condition of your heart is what makes you more holy, more pure, and more acceptable in God's sight. The heart is the source of true religion. Ceremonial acts and special foods cannot give you a true love for God. Now, um, I just want to illustrate this. I don't know if you remember, but uh, when I was young, mafia movies were quite popular. And, uh, and they were really popular, and you would always see in these movies or TV shows that the protagonist would do something terrible, and then he would go to the Roman Catholic priest, and he would say, Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. And then he'd carry on and do more terrible things and come back and say, Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. And he thought that this act of sitting in this, with his, in this booth with this lattice between himself and the priest and him saying these words could really make him acceptable to God. When there was no heart change, when he continued with his sinful lifestyle, he thought that just saying these words to this person could really somehow make him acceptable to God without any change in his sinful heart attitude behavior. So this man was then, these people then, were just deceiving themselves. And that's a picture of this kind of external false religion that has no power to change who people are. So, now that we've thought about the, the fact that it is all about the heart and it is what comes from within our heart that can defile us, what should we as people do about our heart? Well, then we have to go to Scripture, don't we, and see what Scripture tells us to do. And, and the wisdom of God is revealed to us in Scripture. Proverbs 4 Verse 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence. Notice it doesn't say follow your heart with all diligence. It says watch over your heart because that's the source of defilement. For from it flow the springs of life. The issues of life flow from your heart. The battle for true faith is won or lost in the heart. The battle for godliness is won or lost in the heart. The battle for spiritual life, all life, life that is worth living, is won or lost in the heart. So Christian, never decry a sin in public that you foster in your heart. That is the application here of this principle. So there's a bit of textual work we need to do here as we get to verse 16. It says, if anyone has ears to hear, he should listen. Now in many of your Bibles, you'll see some brackets there. Or maybe the text might be moved to a footnote. And what does that mean? It means that this verse is, is not found in the oldest manuscripts we have of the New Testament. But it is found in many, many, many other later manuscripts. And so the translators of your version have put it in for your consideration. And so... Uh, my sermon on dealing with the text of the New Testament is coming later, but for now I just want to say this. The, this. This statement does not change the meaning or the burden of what Jesus is saying here. It just helps highlight the fact that this saying was seen as a parable. But the fact is verse 17 makes it clear that the disciples saw it as a parable anyway. This statement, if anyone has ears to hear, he should listen, is, is what normally comes after Jesus' teaching in the book of Mark. If you look at chapter 4, you'll see Jesus has a time of public teaching. He closes that, those times of teaching with a statement, if anyone has ears to hear, he should listen. And he does it in chapter 4, verse 9, and in chapter 4, verse 23. And so what probably happened here is a, a well-meaning scribe saw the same pattern here. In chapter 4, you saw Jesus was preaching to the crowd, and then he said, if anyone has ears to hear, you should listen. And then he moved to a private setting where he explained his teaching to the disciples. He sees that same pattern here in chapter 7. He, says, he sees in verse 15, Jesus addressing the crowd and telling them that profound principle. And then he sees Jesus explaining it to his disciples after they leave, when they're in the house. And so he, sees, he looks at that and he probably thought, well, this is probably needs to have that statement there. That statement's probably missing. 
when he, when he looked at his copy of the scriptures that he was copying. And so he added it in, probably as an explanatory note, as probably a question in the margin. And over time, as people copy manuscripts, something that's in the margin can easily move into the main body of the text. And, and it can be there for a long time. And this is really, for me, an evidence of the accuracy of the Bibles that we have. It shows that nothing that was necessary was lost. Even things that translators or scribes were not sure about, they would put it in just to, to have it there so that if someone later could come and evaluate and consider if it was part of the original text or not. And this is a wonderful truth. Other religions do not have this kind of, um, this kind of faithful copying of scriptures over generations and generations. And here we have a, probably a note from a scribe added in around the 5th century surviving until today. And what a faithful testimony of God's word, of God, the reliability of the texts of the New Testament. And so we've seen then that the heart originates, and we'll be moving on now to the stomach eliminates, verses 17 to 19. Look at verse 17 with me. It says, then he went into the house away from the crowd. The disciples asked him about the parable. This shows us something, that this statement of Jesus was radical even to the disciples. As Jews, they found his statement about the food laws really amazing. They were just expecting Jesus to modify the food laws. But here he is saying that these food laws cannot accomplish greater godliness for you. Because the food laws, you see, were always a picture. They were a picture intended to teach God's people that just in the same way as I want you to separate yourself from these certain kinds of food so you can be set apart for me in the same way God wants His people to set their heart apart and not engage in certain activities so that their heart can be faithful to Him. You see, this was a picture. But the, the Jews thought that the picture was the whole reality. But this was a shadow. And we know this is all fulfilled in Christ. When Christ came, He fulfilled all the food laws and then when he died on the cross and rose again, the curtain in the temple was torn in two, and the, all the ceremonial law was done away with, and this was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt because then God did away even with the temple itself in AD 70. And so you as a Christian have to recognize something. Jesus fulfills the ceremonial law. And either you believe in him to fulfill all those laws for you, or you will have to do those things yourself. And so what a great fulfillment Jesus is. And so he fulfills what he says in Matthew 5, that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to fully obey it, so that we as believers can look to him and trust in him. And in trusting in Christ, we can also be fulfillers of that law. What a wonderful truth that is. And so Jesus is talking to them that they understand, they, they look at these food laws and they're saying this is the most important thing. And Jesus is saying, verse 18, and he said to them, are you also as lacking in understanding? Jesus is, is in a sense surprised that they could find these saying to be a parable when it was just a straightforward saying that if you reason through it, you could come to the right conclusion. And so Jesus then helps his disciples he helps them reason through this statement he's made in verse 15 with a question at the end of verse 18. Don't you realize that nothing going into a man from the outside can defile him? Why can't that defile him? He answers that in verse 19. For or because it doesn't go into his heart, but into the stomach and is eliminated. In other words, food does not enter your personality. It does not affect your moral reactions to life. It does not affect your inner spiritual life. Your stomach digesting food is not a moral process. It is a physiological process. In other words, the stomach digests, but the heart defiles. The stomach only has the ability to digest food, but the heart has the ability to defile you as a person. Peter and Mark get this, and that's why they add the, their own explanatory note there at the end of verse 19. As a result, he made all foods clean. And some of your Bibles will put that statement in brackets because they understand that to be a, an explanatory note. 
just in case you were not clear about this. And Peter was made, was, was made to realize this in Acts chapter 10. And we realized that it took him even then a long time to, to really let go of holding on to these food laws. And it took the whole early church a long time to come to grips with this truth. But the fact is, and it always will be, that food does not affect your relationship with God. The state of your heart does. My friends, it is vital to get this. We must get this. No matter what you eat, honor the Lord with your heart. It is so easy to not eat pork or not eat crustaceans or not eat whatever. It is much harder to consistently think pure thoughts, to think honorable thoughts, to think the best of other people, to seek to be kind and self-controlled. It is much harder to fight against greed and pride and lust that sits in your heart. But that is true religion. It's not whether you eat pork or not. It's whether your heart is committed to the Lord and His ways. And so we've seen then that the heart originates, the stomach eliminates, and we'll be moving on to the life reverberates. What, what the heart, what is, happens in the heart reverberates or echoes in your life. The life reverberates. Jesus then explains, look at verse 20 there, He now helps the disciples understand what really defiles. Since we're talking about the issue of defilement, Jesus says, let's now talk about that. And he says in verse 20, then he said, What comes out of a person, that defiles him. And this is a true statement, if there ever is one. I just want to illustrate this. Have you ever wondered why two people can be sitting in the same traffic jam and can react to it so differently? One person is swearing and showing fingers and hooting and doing all kinds of things, and the other person is enjoying listening to the radio and smiling to himself and, and just enjoying sitting in the car for a few extra minutes. For a few minutes, their surrounding circumstances are identical. They're both in cars. They're both trying to get somewhere. They're both realizing they're not going to get to where they want to go in the time that they'd hoped to get there. But their responses are so different to that same situation. You see, the traffic jam is like a can opener. It's just opening the can of the heart and letting what, what is inside that can come out. It, it is that man's unrighteous anger, who is the man who's getting worked up in his car, his unrighteous anger is already there. It's in the can. The traffic jam is just the can opener. It's just opening up the can and allowing it to come out so that everyone can see what's already there. The other man's patience is already there, and the traffic jam is just... Like a can opener again, opening the can so that everyone can see what's inside that man's heart, the, the patience that is in his heart. And that is just a, a picture of, of what Jesus is saying. It is what comes from within that defiles. Verse 21, Jesus explains further, For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts. Now, the, there's, there's a list now that I've given of, of vices. But the, the root of the list is this term, evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. And then there are 12 vices that spring from the evil thoughts. Remember that biblically speaking, the heart is, just, is not where you feel emotions only. It is also where you think. It is where you decide. It is where you worship. You worship in the heart. You think, you decide, and you worship in the heart. And so evil thoughts is very appropriate when talking about the heart because in, according to the biblical idea of the heart, the heart is where everything happens. It's your inner person. And the, the, idea, the term evil thoughts gives this idea of, of morally bad reasoning. It's reasoning that is morally corrupt. And these thoughts then unite with the will of a person and then they produce the vices, the actions. So you have these thoughts, they come together with your, your ability to decide and choose and, and have a will to do something, and when they unite together, they form all these actions. And so he, he lists them, and I'll just briefly describe them here. 
what he's talking about, these, what really defiles. And when he describes this list, you can see how different it is to the matter of washing your hands a certain way. This is what really defiles. Not washing your hands a certain way can in no way defile you as much as these can. Verse 21, he starts there, he says, sexual immorality, that is any sex outside of marriage. Then he talks about thefts, that is taking what does not belong to you, including time, or, or is not intended to be used for the, in the way you are using it. That is also theft. Murders, this is the ultimate theft, taking someone's life. Adultery, this is a, an affair with someone else's spouse. Greed, that is not being content with what you have, but having an insatiable desire for more than God has allowed you to enjoy at this time in your life. Evil actions. These are the various ways that evil thoughts show themselves in action. Deceit. This is using your words to trick people to believe something about you or about anything else that is not true. This word describes how someone devises dishonest ways of entrapping other people for his own or her own benefit. Then it talks about promiscuity. That is unbridled lust that shows itself in repeated fornication without concern even for public opinion. Stinginess. This is literally an evil eye. This is being jealous over your money and not wanting to be generous. Deuteronomy 15 verse 9 explains this using the same term, the evil eye. It says, be careful that there isn't this wicked thought in your heart. The seventh year, the year of canceling debts is near, and you are stingy, or your eye is evil toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. He will cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty. And so we see the evil eye there. That, that's what can defile you. Blasphemy. You know, some Christians think that blasphemy is not a sin because they see it so much in movies and on TV. It's still a sin. Jesus disagrees with you if you think blasphemy is not a sin. He says, yeah, it's a sin. He, he says it defiles you. He groups it with other wicked acts. When you use God's name in an inappropriate way, you are defiling yourself. And that means that you will bear the consequences of that. And then he talks about pride. He says the next one is pride, the evil, that evil thing. Oh, that evil thing of putting yourself above others in your heart. Very difficult to detect pride because it happens in the heart. It's very difficult to detect if it's there, but sometimes in conversation and in actions, it brings itself to bear. It's that evil of having an exalted opinion of yourself and your ability to think through things and a low view of other people to do the same. In other words, you think the way you see things is much more important than the way other people see things. And this all starts in the heart. And then foolishness. This is the person who, who does not care to know God or fear God and lives his life according to Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. His life anthem is doing everything his way. What God wants and God's way, not important to the fool. The fool lives as if there is no God. He's bent on doing whatever he wants to do. And that is what defiles him. And Jesus says, all these evil things in verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. There are many, many ways to apply this truth. But I want you to think about something. Friend, if there is ugliness in your relationships, this principle teaches us that it doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside. James 4 verse 1 puts it this way. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? Notice it's not from outside. It comes from inside. So when we have difficulty and struggle in our relationships, it's, it's not always helpful to look at what the other person is doing. It is always helpful to look at what's happening in your own heart, in my own heart. I just want to give you another situation where we can think about this a little bit more clearly. You know, it's just another can opener of life, as I was talking about the previous illustration. We have a situation where our church is busy navigating COVID-19. And as we navigate this time, uh, the, 
as a church, as elders of the church, we are expected to make plans and adjust those plans and change plans. And, and we do this all so that we can honor Christ and bless the body as best we can. Now, what is interesting to me is that when elders make a decision, they are, they are, they are very, sometimes very different reactions to the decision. It always interests me how when a decision is made, some people can look at a decision and can respond in trust, can respond in understanding. If maybe they don't understand it fully, so they will respond by asking further questions so they can gain deeper understanding. While other people hear the same decision and they chafe. They chafe against the decision. They, they struggle with it. They wrestle with it. They don't want to accept the outcome. They, they're just really battling to deal with this decision. And, and they're not really wanting to understand more about the decision so they can be better informed. No, they just don't want to accept it. They, they want to reject it. And what is interesting also is that often the people that are chafing most against the decision don't have the facts that the elders often need that have at their disposal to make the decision. So they don't have all the facts that went into the decision, but they're really having difficulty with the decision. This reveals that there's a heart issue going on. Because a decision can't cause ugliness. A decision can't cause difficulty. A decision can't cause people to really battle with, with submitting to authority. A decision is just a decision. There's a heart issue going on. And the heart issue is what will determine the response then. And I don't know what the heart issue is. It could be a difficulty in submitting to authority. I know I struggled with that, and I may struggle with that even now. It may be pride that assumes that I know better than what that person knows. Even though I don't have all the facts, I just innately know I will always know better than that person. That could be that's a form of pride. It could be immaturity. When I was immature, when I was younger and attending church, I always felt like I could have an opinion about everything and I didn't really even know what was going on. I don't know what the heart issue is, but I do know something. That even bad decisions don't cause difficult people. James 4 verse 1 again. What is the source of the wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the craving that are at war within you? He doesn't say they must come from that difficult person, from that ignorant leader, from that bad decision. No, he brings it to the heart. See, decisions can only reveal what's going on in the heart. Because the way we live, our life, will always reverberate or echo the thoughts of our hearts. So we've now looked at the three principles of true religion. The heart originates, the stomach eliminates, and the life reverberates. My question and my challenge for you is, as you consider what I said in the beginning, what does it mean to be a Christian? I want you to look at your life, look at your heart, and ask yourself, am I inwardly living, loving like a believer? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Your goodness to us in sending your Son so that he can pay the price for our sins on the cross, so that he can be risen again, proving to us and all the world that you, Father, have accepted his payment for our sins. Father, we can now be reconciled with you because of what Christ has done we can be your children, we can be adopted into your family, and that we can now live as your children, live as your people. Lord, as we seek to live this Christian life, we are, it is becoming very clear as we study the words of Jesus here that it is not about certain things we do at certain times of the week. It is really a matter of the heart. And Lord, as we think of this, Lord, it is challenging to us. It really is bringing out the fact that 
our hearts need to change. Our hearts need to be more devoted to you, Lord. They need to desire what you desire. They need to love what you love. They need to desire to please you in every and any situation. So, Lord, we, as we think of this, we ask, Lord, for your empowering grace to help us to truly worship you from the heart. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.